Okay, welcome back to History 1302. This is Lecture 14, Origins of the Cold War. Uh, the numbering is kind of a little uh, a little off here uh, because of the way I renumbered the uh, the uh, Great Depression and New Deal and the uh, World War II lectures. But this is Lecture 14. Uh, World War II, as we saw in the last lecture, ended with a bang. It ushered in not peace but rather it ushered a Cold War in uh, that took millions of lives. The difference is uh, for the United States in terms of how we think about war and how we think of conflict is that these, these millions of people dead uh, didn't die in the United States or directly in the Soviet Union, but rather they died in places like Guatemala, they died in Iran, Lebanon, Korea, uh, the Korean Peninsula, North and South Vietnam, Nicaragua, and on and on in all these other parts of the world. In 1945, Winston Churchill uh, had said that it was uh, that we were uh, that peace is nearer at hand and that letting it slip away would be a tragedy. And yet, however, peace did slip away. And by 1946, by March of 1946, Churchill had actually said, uh, quote, from Stettin in the Baltic to Treste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. And behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia, all these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere and all are subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure uh, of control from Moscow. Police governments are prevailing in nearly every case. And so far, except in Czechoslovakia, there is no true democracy. So uh, he was calling this uh, area an iron curtain. He was talking about the Soviet Union exerting this very strong control over this region uh, less than a year after World War II uh, had actually ended. So how did we get to this point? How do we get to a point where the United States and the Soviet Union allies during World War II are at a point where they have come to the brink of war with one another. Well, the first issue that was challenging for both of these sides was the control over Eastern Europe. And I kind of alluded to this uh, in the end of the lecture two on, cold, on uh, World War II, uh, but the United States had wanted what they referred to as free and democratic elections all across Eastern Europe, while the Soviets wanted what they referred to as buffer states from, as, that would function as protection from the West. And uh, laying this out, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, said as, as follows, quote, one cannot forget the following fact that the Germans carried out an invasion of the Soviet Union through Finland, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary. One can ask, therefore, what can be surprising in the fact that the Soviet Union, in a desire to ensure its security for the future, tries to achieve that these countries, countries that border the Soviet Union, should have governments whose relations to the Soviet Union are loyal. He pointed out in this same address that the United States did exactly the same thing. So what the Soviets were asking for, he said, was nothing that unusual. There's nothing crazy going on. Uh, in what he's asking for here. Uh, even before the end of World War II, before the whole process was over, the Soviet Union actually annexed Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and parts of several other countries. And after the war, they were instrumental, the Soviet Union was, in installing pro-Soviet governments in all of these areas and across uh, Central Europe. So one thing that separated them was who's going to be in control of Eastern Europe and how. Second, control over nuclear weapons. The United States had them, uh, and the Soviets knew about this, but what bothered them was that the United States had embarked on a secret program without informing their allies, the Soviet Union. Again, I cannot stress this enough that the United States and the Soviets were allies during World War II. So while the Soviets, through their spy network, had uh, had spies that made them well aware of what was going on. They were really upset that the United States did this in complete secrecy. So Stalin knew what was going on, but he was kind of waiting for the United States to tell him, and they never did. Uh, after World War II was over with, 
the United States called for international control of nuclear weapons, but it was unclear in its conception about who would maintain nuclear technology. The weapons themselves would be turned over to an international atomic agency, but as far as the, the knowledge, the science behind it, uh, blueprints, all of that sort of stuff, it wasn't clear. So the Soviets looked at this and truly believed that the United States would maintain a nuclear monopoly, even in the post Cold War world. So the Soviets actually rejected control, uh, this international control of nuclear weapons. And then the third issue that separates the two powers is the uh, issue of post-war economic aid. The Soviet Union, like many countries in World War II, had been absolutely demolished by the war. And in the immediate aftermath, they asked the United States for massive loans for recovery. And the United States offered the Soviet Union loans. A lot of times, uh, Americans act as if, you know, the, so the Soviets were kind of left on their own and the United States didn't, quote, offer anything. The United States did actually offer these loans. However, the United States offered them loans on the condition that the Soviet Union give in on the issue of democratic elections in Eastern Europe, and they give in on the issue of international control of nuclear weapons. So once again, the Soviets who had asked for these loans uh, rejected the conditions that were placed on the loans. In the end, the United States, which would provide massive post-war recovery loans uh, for the rest of Europe, provided the Soviet Union, their major ally, with no uh, loans. Uh, and as a result, the Soviet Union felt that they really didn't have much of a choice. They wound up stripping Eastern Germany of virtually all of its factory uh, and uh, heavy technology and equipment uh, and literally dismantled this stuff and carried it back to the Soviet Union. Now, at this point, what we're talking about, all these things that I've been mentioning here, these are things that are, uh, it's about a conflict and ideology, but so far there's no real war that's actually happening. The conflict is just more of an ideological thing than anything else. There are a number of state steps that it takes to go further in that progression where there is actual physical confrontation between the two sides. Uh, and the first thing that's going to happen is the creation of a new doctrine for the United States, the so-called Truman Doctrine. Up until World War II, the British had always been the quote-unquote world's police, if you will. If there was something that was going on across the globe, if there was a crisis point somewhere around the world, the British would likely be the ones that would intervene because they had this large empire. It was all over the world. Uh, it was said, you know, the, the phrase, uh, the sun never sets on the British empire because the British were virtually everywhere. So they're positioned to work uh, as this sort of world police, if you will. But after World War II was over, the British said, we don't have the ability anymore. Our economy has been crippled and we can't do this anymore. And in 1947, to be precise, the British announced that they were pulling out, that they were withdrawing military support from both, both Greece and Turkey. Now, in the immediate aftermath, that caused problems. In Greece, there was a guerrilla war that developed over who was going to be in control in Greece. Was it going to be the uh, traditional monarchy in Greece, or was it going to be a number of guerrillas who were looking to, out, uh, to oust the royal family? Uh, say a similar circumstance was going on in Turkey uh, in that there was no real political control in Turkey outside of the British government. So once the British government said we're leaving, it became a mad dash to figure out who's actually going to be in power here. And one of the groups that actually offered to fill the vacuum, Soviet Union offered to fill the vacuum and, func and function in Turkey the same way that the British had, that they would prop up a quote unquote independent government in Turkey. Uh, and as far as the president of the United States, Harry Truman saw this, neither one of those positions were acceptable. The, uh, these guerrilla fighters in Greece, uh, nor the Soviets uh, exercising any control uh, in Turkey. He became very angry about this and decided that the United States was going to provide assistance to the monarchy in Greece and to what he referred to as, quote, the Democrats, small d, he's not talking about a political party, but rather people who are seeking to bring democracy to Turkey. 
he announced his plans in his address, his annual address to Congress, and this plan became known as the Truman Doctrine. The idea behind the Truman Doctrine is very simple. I'm going to read you what Truman wrote. And I'm going to tell you what basically it means. Truman wrote, at the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. The choice is too often not a free one. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. I believe, this is Harry Truman again, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. That's the key part of this. The last sentence is the key position that Truman is staking out. Truman says that the United States is going to support free people resisting internal subversion. That's the Greeks. The Greeks are fighting these guerrillas who would try to oust the traditional monarchy. So they're willing, they're willing, we are willing to support free people resisting, quote, internal subversion or external aggression. That's the case of Turkey, where they're looking to keep those Soviets out, or we are looking to keep the Soviets out of this. So it's very simple. We're going to help these types of countries. We're going to help Greece. We're going to help Turkey as long as they are fighting this sort of issue uh, of communism. Now, the Truman Doctrine is the first step in an overall grand strategy known as containment. Containment got its name from an article that appeared in Foreign Affairs magazine. The article was called The Sources of Soviet Conduct. You don't need to really know the article or anything like that. But it was authored by a guy who gave his name on the article as, quote, Mr. X. Mr. X was actually George Frost Kennan, one of Truman's State Department advisors. But this is a different era. In 1947, uh, State Department personnel didn't actually write articles like this uh, openly. They didn't put uh, they didn't write editorials for The New York Times like uh, State Department officials do today. So Kennan wrote this under the pseudonym Mr. X as a way of saying this is what the United States needs to be doing. So what Kennan argued in this Sources of Soviet Conduct was, is that if the United States stopped the Soviet Union from expanding beyond its current borders, from its present state, that the Soviet Union would eventually collapse. The idea of communism, Kennan said, requires consistent, constant expansion because it doesn't produce the necessary, re necessary resources, doesn't produce the necessary wealth to keep it going. So it must constantly expand. It must constantly go out seeking new territory. So it's very simple. If we want to stop the Soviet Union, we stop the expansion. We contain it to its present boundaries. If that happens, he says, the destruction of the Soviet Union will be inevitable. Now, Kennan wound up creating a policy, a strategic policy, if you will, that becomes the U.S.'s policy for the next 40 years. The United States is just going to look at it and say, we just don't want the Soviets expanding. Okay, they, Where they are is what it is. We're just going to let them be. But we don't want them expanding into, say, Eastern Europe. We don't want them expanding into Southern Europe. We don't want them expanding into Latin America. We don't want them expanding into Asia or anywhere else. Okay. Every place in the world becomes a battle, a strategic battleground for the United States under this type of policy, under containment, courtesy of something else that Kennan created uh, called the domino theory. And the domino theory was basically it's exactly what it sounds. Countries are like dominoes and that when one gets knocked down, the next domino becomes susceptible to falling and the next one becomes susceptible to falling until finally the last domino that would fall in this sort of theory is the United States. So everywhere is important, even if someplace is nowhere near the United States and would look to be completely unimportant to quote unquote us under containment and the domino theory, it is critical to American foreign policy. 
Now, the reason I say, just to kind of tie a bow on all of this, the reason I say this was the foreign policy until 1940 is, is that in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan wins the election. And when he announces his new foreign policy initiatives and the like, his policy is called rollback. It's not going to just be we're content with wherever the United or where the Soviet Union presently is. We're going to seek to undermine the Soviet Union in every place that it exists. We're going to uh, we're going to we're going to we, we seek ultimately the destruction of the Soviet Union from within, not just from outside the Soviet Union. So Reagan's policies in the 1980s are going to be a little bit different uh, than all of this stuff. Now, how do you create containment? How do you create uh, the Truman Doctrine in actuality? Well, one way is through military alliances. For the first time, the United States is going to create defensive military obligations. These are things that were without precedent. Okay, The United States had always said, we do not engage in permanent entangling alliances. Well, in the post-World War II era, the United States looks at this and says, no, we need to de be devoted to the idea of collective security. That's what the United Nations was all about. And specifically, the United States is going to create a number of alliances like NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, ANZUS, Australia, New Zealand, US, which is essentially a NATO for that part of the world, and the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CEDO, and the way each one of these is going to work. This is a collective security arrangement. All of the countries that are signatories to NATO or ANZUS or CETO look at each other as allies and say that essentially, if you're attacked, we're all attacked and we all come to each other's aid. Now, what the United States is going to seek with each one of these arrangements is they're also going to, they're going to say, yes, we're involved, we're going to come to your aid. But in the meantime, and under most circumstances, the United States is going to look to a regional superpower in those areas to manage the process. They're going to be essentially in charge of keeping things secure. So for example, in NATO, uh, Great Britain is going to be the regional superpower. In CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, uh, Japan, once it's rebuilt, will be the regional superpower in all of these. So military alliances is one way. Second way, and by far the most uh, important and successful method, was through economic means. And the first vehicle the United States uses is called the Marshall Plan. Under the Marshall Plan, the European economy is going to be rebuilt using American dollars to do it. Uh, the European economy had been devastated following World War II, so, and, and people were clearly suffering. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Europe, Europeans were consuming about a third the number of calories that Americans were consuming every day. Uh, and that was out of desperation. That wasn't out of a, you know, well, we have a superior diet or anything. This was a matter of this is desperation and starvation on the part of Europeans. And U.S. policymakers looked at this very simply. When people are hungry, when they're poor, they tend to turn to and support more radical measures. And it looked to American policymakers as if the French were willing to vote for uh, communist uh, and socialist regimes. Italy was on the verge of electing a socialist regime. And the president of the United States was looking for ways to make sure this did not happen. And the Secretary of State, George Marshall, which is why it's called the Marshall Plan, comes up with this idea. Marshall had been the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during World War II. And as Marshall saw it, this was very simple. The United States will devote as much as 10% of its annual budget toward putting money in European banks so that, the United, so that European banks can loan money for entrepreneurial purposes, so that they can loan money for infrastructure building and all of this stuff as a way of keeping those European economies rolling so that they don't have to quote unquote turn to communism or socialism, so it contains the communism, and it allows the European economy to recover. And this thing works. The Marshall Plan is a rousing success. The United States dedicates literally billions of dollars to the Marshall Plan, and it works. Now, the United States also embarks 
on an ambitious plan in Southeast Asia as well. During World War II, and in the lead up to World War II, Japan was attempting to create a similar program. What Japan was doing uh, was they created something that they called, quote, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Okay, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And it was a very simple idea. Japan would serve as a conduit for financing, for finished goods, for new technology. Japan would be a key or core economy in the region uh, because they would have all of these important things like the raw material, like they would bring in the raw materials, turn them in to finished goods. They would have the, uh, essentially a monopoly on technology. And then areas like China, Korea, present day Vietnam, the rest of Asia, they would all become what are called peripheral areas because they would be the ones that would provide the raw materials to Japan. And then when Japan finished the raw materials or turning the raw materials into finished goods, they'd sell them to the consumers in the rest of that so-called periphery, okay? Again, the key industries, the most important and the most uh, wealth producing industries like steel production, auto manufacturing, that sort of stuff, that would stay in Japan. Outdated industries would wind up being farmed out to the peripheral areas. Uh, things that were inconsequential in terms of monetary production, things like uh, rubber plants, uh, things like the finishing of clothing and all that, that would go out to the peripheral part of the world. This, was, this whole idea of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere was one of the things that hamstrung the United States in the 1930s, because the United States always looked at those raw materials and those marketplaces as theirs, not the Japanese marketplaces and not Japanese raw materials. So they didn't like this. This is one of the things that was causing those two to be at odds in the lead up to World War II. It's what led it to the attack at Pearl Harbor and all of the US possessions in Southeast Asia. Now, once World War II was over, the military governor of Japan was Douglas MacArthur, a general in the United States Army. And he kind of one day was trying to figure out what to do uh, about Japan and how to bring it back from the brink of all of this destruction and get their economy moving. And the story goes that he saw a map of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere and went, that's it. That's what will bring Japan back. So after all of this time trying to destroy the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, in the post-war world, essentially what the United States did was they used the basics of that economic relationship to establish the United States as the real core, the financing capital of all of this stuff, while Japan would be the manufacturing and finished goods part of the core, and then the rest of Asia would function as the periphery. And again, it works. It works dramatically well. The atomic bombs are dropped in 1945. Japan surrenders in 1945. By 1951, Japan was back on its feet. Japan had a fully functioning economy and sovereignty had been restored to Japan on the basis of their economic prowess. So this plan worked and it worked well in, uh, in as far as Japan was going. Now, there was another issue to deal with uh, in, the, in terms of economics. Uh, and what winds up happening uh, before World War II is even over, 44 nations got together in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire to try to determine uh, a post-war economic order, if you will. Uh, and at stake was uh, at Bretton Woods uh, was the shape of capitalism, what, how we're going to manage capitalism and make sure that it doesn't fall into the same pitfalls that it had, that it had fallen into in the post-World War I era, during the Great Depression era. So how do we make sure that we don't just simply go right back into that in the post-World War II era? What these people decided, uh, what these leaders decided, was they, it's called the Bretton Woods system because they're meeting in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. What they agreed was this new economic order. Previously, all world currency was pegged to something measurable, the price of gold. So if a country has dollars, 
or a monetary system, whatever it is, the English pound or the Italian lira, whatever it is, whatever their money is, is it's based on a measurable thing like gold. For example, a $5 bill of US currency got you $5 worth of gold. That's what the gold standard is. You can take that money, you can take the, the, the cash currency, walk into a bank and get the equivalent in gold. That's what the gold standard is all about. But after World War II was over, and this is true after World War I as well, there's only one country that has enough economic capabilities to be able to bail out the rest of the world, and that's the United States. So after World War II was over, what the countries agreed was is that instead of pegging everything to gold, everything would be pegged to gold based on its measure in U.S. dollars. Okay, So what that means is, is if you want to think about this as a mathematical equation, I'm sure plenty of you have taken math and know uh, various math classes and know that if A equals B and B equals C, then A also equals C. Well, that's what's going on here. If the English pound is convertible to gold measured in U.S. dollars and gold is measured in U.S. dollars, then the English pound has a value based on U.S. dollars. And that's exactly what's happening here. Everybody is pegging their currency to gold based on the U.S. price of gold. So they're basing it on the value of the dollar. Why? Why the US dollars? Why would they do this? Well, it's very simple. Again, the United States had the largest economy in the world. They also had been incredibly productive. The United States had been incredibly productive during World War II. But a lot of Americans were really afraid of how this is going to play out post World War II. We've got a lot of production. We've gotten a lot, we've paid a lot of people, but what happens afterward? So afterwards, so Bretton Woods system is going to take advantage of this U.S. Uh, economic power. Uh, in addition to this idea of pegging all currency to gold based on the U.S. price of gold, the Bretton Woods system is going to create the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, and in the cases of both of these, uh, both of these uh, uh, institutions, what countries are going to do is they're going to refinance uh, or finance uh, programs to fix their economies, uh, infrastructure programs, uh, entrepreneurial programs. They're going to borrow money. And essentially what they're going to do is they're going to borrow U.S. dollars to do all of this. Now, the way it's created, the way the whole system is created, the nations that are a part of the Bretton Woods system have a subscription to underwrite both the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And the way they finance this, the way they underwrite their subscription, 25% of the buy-in is in gold and 75% is in their own currency. Now, I think I've talked about this before, but a, but a piece of currency, like a, a $5 bill, it really is not much more than an IOU. Okay, it does essentially function that same way. It's got $5 worth of purchasing power, but it's really kind of just an agreement that this has $5 worth of purchasing power. So it's worth pointing out here, it's worth thinking about this for a minute, that only 25% of the buy-in or the uh, subscription is gold, 75% of the buy-in or subscription is in currency, in credit. Now, this is where the problems actually begin with the Bretton Woods system. When this thing is created, when Bretton Woods is created, the total amount of gold that was in existence in the world was a grand total of $33 billion. The United States held $26 billion of that. The rest of the world collectively held $7 billion. Now, as long as trade doesn't just explode, everything will be fine because within the Bretton Woods system is a circumstance where if countries get, they borrow dollars and their economy works, all of this stuff works, it starts rolling, and they've now got all of these US dollars, they have to be able to get rid of dollars. They have to be able to redeem the dollars. 
and the redemption is for gold. So if all of a sudden, all of these countries start becoming incredibly productive and they start bringing in lots and lots of dollars to redeem for gold, what's going to happen is, is the US's gold reserves are going to start dwindling. This $26 billion is going to be less important. It's going to become less, uh, it's going to become lesser over time. So there's a potential problem built right into this, even if the United States is thinking, oh, it's probably not going to happen. Well, here's what does actually happen. Between 1946 and 1971, the world gold supply increases by 3%, let me do it that way, 3%, while world trade in that same period increases by 600%. So countries are going to be desperately redeeming those dollars for gold. And on three separate occasions, I'm just going to kind of spoil part of the surprise. On three separate occasions, the United States is actually going to suspend redemption. They're literally going to tell these countries that, yeah, we know, we know you've got all these U.S. dollars. We know you're used to be able to, uh, to being able to redeem them, but we're not going to redeem those dollars anymore. And finally, the reason uh, this is set up as 1971 as an endpoint, it's very simple. In 1971, the president of the United States at that point, Richard Nixon, says, we're not on the gold standard anymore. And as far as that Bretton Woods system goes, we're out. We're not part of it anymore. It no longer exists. So this is a potential problem here. This is a real potential problem. Uh, in order to meet its obligations, the United States' gold reserves are going to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle, and the U.S. is going to suffer as a consequence of this. Now, both of these institutions, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, are created to provide loans for infrastructure and development, okay? And that's important, loans for infrastructure and development. A country could not come to the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund and say, by the way, we have a massive national debt. Is it possible that we could refinance this stuff? IMF and World Bank forbid that sort of stuff. It's about loans for infrastructure and development. Now, why that is so important? Think about what happened after World War I, okay? After World War I, the United States loaned all of that money to Germany to refinance their debt. And instead of using that to engage in the infrastructure development, instead of building up their entrepreneurial lending and stuff like that, Germany simply just took that money and paid it back in reparations to England and France. And then England and France simply paid back their obligations to the United States. So Bretton Woods, the Marshall Plan, the IMF and World Bank, all of this stuff is done as a way to make sure that we're not just passing this debt back and forth in a shell game around the rest of, uh, around the entire world, not just in the United States, but around the entire world. Now, adding to this, during the course of the war, during the course of World War II, something else became very clear to American economists, to, in particular, government economists. There were 16 million men, I referenced this in the last lecture, uh, the last part of uh, Mod 2, 16 million men served in the United States Armed Forces over the total, over the course of World War II. All of those men were being paid, but since most of them were off serving overseas, they weren't buying a whole lot with that money. In some cases, men were coming home with figuratively with their pockets bulging with money because they'd been paid, but they couldn't possibly spend it effectively overseas. And even at home, even here in the United States during World War II, there were massive consumer shortages because everything was needed for wartime production. So the problem here is this, people could not spend the money that they were earning fast enough. And this creates a very specific problem in the United States economy. Now, let's see how many of you have been paying attention since we've talked about this problem in the 1870s, 1890s, and during the Great Depression. The problem facing the U.S. economy is very simply under consumption. If you don't have people buying things, 
the economy will not work. You can manufacture all of whatever you want. If you want to get in the business of manufacturing coffee mugs or cell phones or pens or computer mice, whatever, you want to get into that, that's great. But if people can't afford to buy those things, it's irrelevant. So there has to be baseline consumption. So the Bretton Woods system, the IMF, the World Bank, Marshall Plan, all of it is about addressing the fundamental problem of underconsumption. Okay. So that's why the United States, along with 44 other countries, created this system. Reconstruction of the world's econ economies based on their own production, based on their own consumption, and one that very clearly allowed the United States to dump unwanted dollars out of their economies. Okay. Now, the IMF and World Bank, as I mentioned, had several caveats to it, Okay, several stipulations. In addition to requiring that the funds be spent on infrastructure and building up a nation's industrial capacity, they also required that things like resources be privatized, things like land be privatized, uh, the extraction of resources had to be privatized. That meant nations in South America, for example, could not, would not be allowed to uh, allow peasants to have communal land holdings, not if they took money from the IMF and World Bank. No longer would states be allowed to engage uh, in state-granted monopolies, like in Chile, for example, where the country wanted help building their infrastructure, uh, and the IMF and World Bank said, fine, we'll do that. But that means you have to open up your doors to investment from other countries in extraction of things like bat guano, for example. As silly as that sounds, uh, bat guano was extracted to create fuel. So it had to be opened up to privatization as opposed to operated by the state. Privatization was something that allowed American companies like uh, Brown and Root, uh, Bechtel Corp to actually go into countries to bid on their infrastructure programs or to build transportation networks uh, or all sorts of other things uh, and spend those money, spend those dollars, employ people and keep the dollars moving. Okay. The point is keep them moving and keep those dollars being productive. Now, as with everything we've talked about this semester. There is undoubtedly a good, okay? We're talking about good and bad stuff here again. Undoubtedly a good, only the United States, uh, along with the IMF and World Bank, had the funds to develop the various resources and marketplaces like this. Uh, the United States was by far the single biggest subscriber to the IMF and World Bank system. So uh, it's not even close uh, that the United States was uh, was a critical part of this. Uh, if it were not for the funds that were put into this by the United States, uh, then industries and infrastructures in several poor, poorer nations uh, could not have been developed as they were. Uh, now, again, I want to make clear, I'm, I'm not saying that they couldn't have been developed at all, but they certainly would not have been developed uh, as they were. The outcomes would have been absolutely different. Uh, and regardless of what the what negative outcomes happened, the development of infrastructure, the development of these industries probably could not have happened without the United States' involvement. It's also undeniable that in virtually all of Latin America and all of what we re frequently refer to as, quote, the third world, caloric intake actually increased uh, in all of these areas, especially Western Europe. Caloric intake, uh, in some cases, tripled uh, as a consequence of the IMF, World Bank, and the Marshall Plan. And several economies, certainly the United States economy, but several other economies globally benefited from this system. Remember, global trade ex uh, expanded by 600%, and it's not just the United States that's benefiting here. But there's also, also obviously bad. Uh, the bad part of Bretton Woods and the IMF and World Bank, it created massive debts in the so-called third world. Countries were borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. Even if an infrastructure program didn't pan out, it was looked at as a good investment because it kept dollars moving. I'll give you an example. Coca-Cola wanted to put in an, a, uh, an infrastructure program that in addition to creating 
water delivery to each to every person's house like we have you know turn the water up turn the tap on water comes out they also thought well we'll underwrite that so that we can experiment with the idea of bringing coca-cola to people's houses like that turn on the tap coca-cola comes out of your tap now it was a massive failure okay they could never get the the mix right uh it obviously came through piping and it was it came out hot not cold so it was a massive failure but it was a success on another level in that it kept dollars flowing productively into these countries so it didn't matter if a if a program failed or not it was worthwhile if it kept dollars moving so countries wanted to borrow money even if they failed they were going to borrow money from from these institutions so they racked up massive amounts of debt now it's also worth pointing out here that those who reaped the profits from the extraction of various natural resources or from the infrastructure development uh, were not the natives of these countries that were involved but rather large multinational corporations uh, Oil and petroleum, for example, in the Middle East, bat guano, as I mentioned, in Chile, mineral uh, metals in Argentina and Mexico. The countries themselves don't benefit from this. In, uh, in Argentina, for example, the split uh, on, uh, on gold and silver mining uh, was uh, the companies that were extracting this were getting 75%, excuse me, 65% of the, the gross while the state of Argentina got 35%. So they're borrowing money from the IMF. They're saying, the IMF is saying, okay, but you have to open yourself up to private investment. And those private investors are getting the bulk of the resource, not Argentina. Argentina is left with the debt and having to pay off the debt with only 35% of the resource. So it's very, very much an unfair system here. Now, with Bretton Woods and Mar uh, the IMF and all of that, we also have an ugly side as well. The ugly side to all of this is it created a system that allowed for the free flow of capital, but not labor. Money actually possessed more rights than human beings under this system. That's not a good thing. This also created a system of dependency. A lot of those countries wound up being dependent on the cycle of borrowing money from the IMF and World Bank, and then having to go back and borrow more, and then having to go back and borrow more, and borrow more, and borrow more. And then lastly, this system gave American corporations undue influence in the affairs of these nations. For example, I keep coming back to Chile with the issue of bat guano. Uh, well, bat guano was one resource they had, but Chile also wanted there to be a system of telephone del service delivery throughout the country. They wound up contracting through the IMF and World Bank. They contracted with IT&T to provide that telephone service. IT&T defaulted on the contract. So Chile kicked them out, said, you're done. You've, you've failed to meet your part of this agreement. IT&T turned to the United States State Department and asked the United States to get rid of the sitting government in Chile, which they did in 1973. Uh, this is not uh, Professor Cahan Lust uh, subscribing to conspiracy theory or anything. These are all things that are doc very well documented uh, in the State Department archives. Uh, so this is, this is not any sort of supposition. So it is really an ugly system that gets created, regardless of whatever beneficial things that came out of it. There's a really nasty side to all of this stuff too. So we've got the stage set for all of this to become, uh, with the Cold War, to become a brutal physical struggle as well. Up to this point, the Cold War is at its heart an ideological struggle, okay? It's just Truman and Stalin for the most part trading I, uh, I hate you's back and forth and saying, well, this is how we see the post-war world. This is how we see it. But it does become very confrontational over the next issue. And the next issue is the reunification of Germany. And the symbol of this is the so-called Berlin airlift. After World War II, the allies, the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, they had divided Germany into four sectors. They even split the capital city of Berlin into four sectors. 
a U.S. sector, a British sector, a French sector, and a Soviet sector. In 1947, the United States proposed German reunification. They thought that the time had come. Germany was ready. They had been, uh, you know, the debris had been picked up, so to speak. It was time now to start dealing with Germany as a sovereign nation. Joseph Stalin did not agree with this. And to be fair to Joseph Stalin, literally millions of Soviet soldiers had been killed in this war. And it looked to the Soviet people as well as if the United States and the rest of the allies kind of turned their back and let the Soviets go through this. So Stalin was not keen on a German reunion tour, if you will. So he said, no, we don't want to do this. So he opposes all of this. Instead of saying, all right, let's figure this out. Let's hash this out. What the other three allies did was they said, we're going to go ahead with reunification. And if you don't like it, it's just too bad. So the three other sectors, the U.S. sector, the British sector, and the French sector reunified and became a separate country called West Germany, while the Soviet-controlled sector got dubbed East Germany. Uh, Stalin was furious about this whole thing, and he announced that he would blockade all goods into and out of Germany, including food, via an air blockade. He was serious about this. He said, if, if this is the way this is going to be settled, if it's just going to be kind of imposed on us, then we're not going to go along. We'll fight back the only way we have. So when this Berlin, this blockade is, is created, two million people who lived there uh, were completely cut off from all accesses uh, of, of food and uh, delivery of medication and medical supplies and all of this. Within 24 hours, Harry Truman had gone to the United States Congress and gotten approval to engage in a massive airlift of food and goods into Berlin that was known as, quote, the Berlin Airlift. Now, this Berlin Airlift lasts for 11 months. And over the course of those 11 months, the United States dropped 4,500 tons of food and medical supplies every single day into Berlin. Now, this was, to, I, I, I don't mean to be glib about this, this was a massive game of chicken between Joseph Stalin and Harry Truman. Joseph Stalin could have stopped this at any point. What you see on the screen here is a U.S. cargo plane. They were flying that low. So clearly the Soviets could have stopped this. They could have attacked these cargo planes. They could have made an entire mess out of this thing if they had decided they wanted to. But the Soviets didn't. The Soviets were just simply thinking that Truman would back down on all of this. They didn't. They, Truman didn't back down. Uh, so Cl Truman, or excuse me, Stalin was clearly just trying to send a message uh, to Truman. After 11 months, Stalin ended the blockade. So the Berlin airlift uh, broke that blockade. And Stalin, it, came, it emerged in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed and historians got access to Soviet archives, Stalin essentially admitted during this Berlin airlift that the Cold War was unwinnable on the part of the Soviets. Uh, if the United States could come in and drop that kind of food and material into the Soviet Union, or excuse me, into Berlin on a daily basis, then there's no way the Soviet Union can win. They just simply couldn't keep up. Now, up to this point, now this staves off a physical confrontation between the Soviets and the other allies, but there is still some containment at this point. It's a containment of the Cold War into uh, in, uh, amongst Europe, but the Cold War is going to wind up expanding globally here as well. First, in October of 1949, communists that were led by Mao Zedong took over China following a 10-year revolution. The United States, the pro-United States government, excuse me, in China was expelled and fled to Taiwan. Now, Americans had actually felt a bond over China since the 1850s. Missionaries had been going there, uh, 
to the to China since the 1850s. The United States had funneled a significant amount of money into China. And during World War II, specifically, they gave a lot of money to a Chinese uh, warlord uh, named Chiang Kai-shek, pictured on the bottom of the screen here, uh, bottom right of the screen. The whole point of giving Chiang Kai-shek money was that he, there was a hope among American policymakers that he could unite Chinese people against the Japanese and, by, and in doing so, keep the Japanese uh, weakened uh, or in a more weakened state. Uh, however, Chiang Kai-shek, generally speaking, used this, this money uh, for his own entourage and for his own enrichment, uh, not for the benefit of China. And when World War II was over, people in China overwhelmingly rejected Chiang Kai-shek and began turning to another guy, Mao Zedong, on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, this process of Chinese people turning against Chiang Kai-shek and turning toward Mao Zedong was not a shock to people within the State Department. There were lots of people in the State Department who had been, rec who had been recommending for years that they get rid of Chiang Kai-shek and find somebody else to do their bidding. Nonetheless, when China overthrew Chiang Kai-shek and turned to Mao, Truman felt that he had been betrayed by the, uh, the Asia office of the State Department. Uh, and he believed he'd been misled. And ultimately, he, Truman fired all of his high-ranking officials in the Asia office of the State Department. This was problematic because the United States was going to spend the next two decades uh, wrapped up in what's going on in Asia between the Korean War and the Vietnam War. So this had long-standing uh, or long-term devastating consequences. As far as Mao Zedong is concerned, there was no question that Mao Zedong was communist uh, in his orientation, in terms of his plans for China. But it's equally clear that most people in China supported Mao, not because they favored communism, but because Mao Zedong was also a nationalist. He supported the idea that all of the resources in China, all of the things that are coming uh, out of China, should be used to enrich the people of China not Western corporations or not Western governments like the United States. And a lot of the Chinese people looked at Mao and said, well, we can kind of overlook the communism in favor of this nationalist uh, sort of stuff. So they were, they were behind Mao, even if they weren't you know, really, really behind Mao, even if they didn't necessarily uh, love everything uh, about communism. So uh, it was a very complicated relationship uh, in China. Now, the Cold War had a huge effect on the United States. Uh, from a psychological standpoint, uh, it unquestionably created a culture of paranoia. Americans were deathly afraid of many things uh, during the Cold War. All of these things were superficially about communism, but there were other issues uh, that were going on in the United States. The Cold War was important because in a lot of ways, it brought war home to the United States. The United States post-war, post-World War II, wound up having bases in 44 different countries, as well as some sort of a military presence in 93 different countries. So one of the, theme, the themes we're going to look at going forward here is how and how this happened and why, and how the United States adopted, adapted to all of this stuff. So what we're going to find out in adapting to that is that the Cold War is as significant an issue as virtually anything else that happens in American history. Without the Cold War, there is no civil rights movement. The way uh, the United States developed the narrative about what liberty means and what individuality means uh, and the importance of conformity as opposed to these ideas of just going off and doing your own thing. Civil rights movement was, in, was uh, enveloped in uh, ideas about liberty uh, and economic betterment uh, and all of this. So the civil rights movement winds up having a big, uh, has a wind, winds up being impacted very dramatically by the Cold War. There's no space program in the United States without the Cold War. The space program was essentially a rush 
between the United States and the Soviet Union to see who could get to space first and who could control space first. So without that fight, without that disagreement and without that competition, the space program doesn't exist. Science fiction winds up being uh, inc incredibly important as a fiction genre in the United States because science fiction could play out these ideas about alien ideas and mind control and subversion. And it could function as a really good vehicle for, for these types of allegories in a way that other genres did not. So science fiction enjoys a sort of resurgence, if you will, uh, during the so-called Cold War, uh, especially in the United States. Now, the United States was utterly convinced, policymakers, social commentators, they were absolutely convinced that communism threatened the United States itself. And this wound up leading to, uh, very consciously, to a second Red Scare. Now, this time, this second Red Scare uh, is not going to focus solely on just subversive organizations. Like if you remember back to World War I and we talked about the first one, uh, the first uh, Red Scare, there was about, you know, the PTA was subversive potentially uh, because of ties to the Soviet Union. People who had uh, radical beliefs like uh, the importance of unionization or rights for women, they were painted as radicals and thus quote unquote Reds. Here, it's not just about organizations, it's about every facet of American life. It's about looking at things and saying that anything that could wind up being construed as weak-minded would allow communism to enter a person's mind or enter our collective psyches. And if that happened, it could destroy the United States. So the result, strangely enough, even though we are a country that prides itself on rugged individualism, and the importance of the individual, the result of the Cold War was an extraordinarily conformist society. When looking at the United States, people were convinced that this weak-mindedness was everywhere, that the Soviets could potentially be invading us through all sorts of things, like comic books, for example. Comic books were a clear area where the way people were portrayed, the way certain things were portrayed, could wind up causing a weak-mindedness in the United States, in particular in the youth of the United States. That's why Batman and Robin changed dramatically during the 1950s. Batman and Robin uh, were looked at uh, not as the Dark Knight uh, and his protege, but rather these two figures that one of whom was very clearly a predator uh, and uh, in order to make sure that that predatorial nature didn't wind up spreading. A lot of the stories of Batman and Robin wind up taking place outside of Wayne Manor during the 1950s. There's a lot of attention paid to alien invaders as opposed to the Joker, as opposed to the Penguin, as opposed to organized crime. Uh, comics wound up having to be approved by, uh, by a group called the Comics Code Authority, and they would determine what was acceptable comic practices and what were not acceptable comic book practices. And if you didn't get the Comics Code Authority seal of approval, your comic book would not get sold. Uh, and stories like uh, the Men at War Man comics became very popular because they glorified ideas about going off to war and fighting off the enemies like the Reds in this case. Uh, in addition, radiation and milk was a big concern in the United States. People truly believed that radiated milk, which was you know, putting radiation through the milk killed all sorts of contaminants, but the thought was also that radiation wound up uh, altering the chemistry in the milk, which would alter the chemistry of those who consumed the milk. So it would create this weak mindedness. The thought was clearly the Soviets are behind the radiating of our milk. So we cannot allow any sort of radiating of milk. And this extended to the idea of, flor of fluoridation of municipal water supplies, putting fluoride into water to make sure that impurities are removed and that that water was not contaminated. This was a no-no in the 1950s. Lots of people absolutely believed that the Soviets were engaging in this, uh, in this conspiracy to use chemistry to do what logic simply could not do.
There was an attack on organized crime, a concerted attack in the 1950s on organized crime, led primarily by a senator named Estes Kefauver. The argument against organized crime, which had always been seen as something that, yes, it was crime, but it protected uh, people at the very bottom levels of society. The thought now was is that it engaged in a sort of illegal uh, uh, un un unleveling of the playing field in terms of the marketplace, in terms of lending money. Uh, organized criminals uh, wound up doing things that made it un gave them unfair advantages in various marketplaces and could not be tolerated any further. The Cincinnati Reds, if the phrase for communists during this era was Reds, uh, then a, a baseball team called the Reds could not be good. So the Cincinnati Reds, while they never officially changed their name, they unofficially did start calling themselves the Red Legs during the 1950s as a way of saying, no, 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 we're not the Reds. That's not who we are. Okay. We're the Red Legs. Are, we're, they're, essentially, they were saying, we're the red legs. We're only called the reds because of the socks we wear, uh, not because of, you know, what's what's in our heart or anything like that. Uh, this continued into the 1960s with the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, we also see the same sorts of things, uh, attacks in college basketball or fears in college basketball. In college basketball, there was a massive gambling scandal. And the thought was, once again, if you can't rely on the sportsmanship and the level playing field of athletic competition, then what else is going to seep in to these young people's minds, potentially communism? There was a fear that the Soviets were behind that. There was a fear that the Soviets were behind rock and roll and how they paid, how people paid disc jockeys because the record companies played or paid, excuse me, paid disc jockeys during the 1950s. They paid them extra money to play certain songs at the expense of other songs. So a lot of people looked at this and said, clearly this is a communist conspiracy to get those songs out there, to get them creeping into people's minds, to weaken their minds so that they uh, would become susceptible to all sorts of other Soviet propaganda. Uh, even things like homosexuality was looked at uh, as obvious evidence uh, of weak mindedness. This is why during the 1950s, there is a sort of unprecedented uh, push deeply into the closet uh, in the United States for homosexuals there. I'm not, I don't want to give you the wrong impression that there was ever some sort of golden age in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s where people were coming out left and right. But in the 1950s, there's a very conscious crackdown on all of this stuff. Uh, and we see it even in things uh, like Batman and Robin, where Batman and Robin start conspicuously going out on double dates during the 1950s because any semblance of homosexuality is proof of a weak mindedness that pervades the United States uh, and leads uh, to uh, the infiltration of communism. Working women was also a similarity. Uh, only in the United States were a lot of people saying that women are best suited only for the domestic sphere. Women can't go out and work for wages. Women shouldn't be serving uh, on an equal basis. Uh, on a parity basis uh, in the militaries, for example. But during World War II, as we mentioned, obviously women did work for wages in the United States and performed very well. Uh, in World War II in the Soviet Union, women were uh, a huge part of combat on the Eastern Front. So when people started thinking about how to differentiate ourselves and how to make sure that we say we are different from the Soviet Union, well, working women was one way to prove that, push women back into the home, back into the domestic sphere, and allow men to take the forefront in the, in the economy uh, and as heads of households and heads of families and all of this stuff. So, you know, we see this concerted effort to get women out of the workforce and to reestablish the authority of males in the household. It's father knows, father knows best, not mother knows best. Uh, and if you think of things like uh, sitcoms like I Love Lucy, uh, one of the things that underpins I Love Lucy is that, you know, sure, Lucy goes out and tries to work and things like that, but it's always disaster whenever she does things that Ricky has told her specifically not to do. Or if she goes out and gets a job, the end result is obviously disaster. If she'd only done what Ricky told her to do, everything would have been fine. So this idea gets reinforced as a way of differentiating ourselves 
from the Soviet Union uh, in the 1950s. Uh, now, we also do some other things that are much more overt in the United States. Virtually every town, uh, small town in the United States, had things that were called uh, communist for a day celebrations, uh, where American legionnaires would dress as red soldiers. Uh, they would lock up city leaders. They'd confiscate guns. They would confiscate books. They'd force people to eat potato soup as a way of saying, this is what life would look like under a communist regime. So all of you people who think communism might be okay, I, we promise you it's not. And then this would all culminate in a rally and a parade down the center of town, often a barbecue. Uh, and they would have these things on, uh, these types of communist for a day things on the International Labor Day, May 1st. They would have them uh, at Founders Day celebrations, July 4th celebrations. All of these things would be playing out as an overt way of saying communism is not acceptable in this country. So when we come back, we'll see how we actually got to that point in the United States. Uh, and we'll uh, move into a, a sort of dual nuclear age where not only the United States has nuclear weapons, but there are other countries that have them as well. So we'll see you next time. Uh, and uh, we're gonna end this particular lecture right here.